what my job is at this point is, well, think of me of, as a kinder version of David Frost, uh, not quite Jay Leno, uh, <laughs> Conan with more facial hair. In dealing with some of the questions that you've all posed, what I'm going to try and do is consolidate. There are a number of you who have asked questions along different themes, and so we'll try and do justice to them by consolidating some of the questions, picking out some individually. But one of the things that I'll note before I start that I didn't in introduce in terms of my own introduction is where I'm bringing a particular perspective to this question, not only with my engagement with ethics, but I ordinarily write on ethics in corporate contexts, ethics for lawyers, development of the legal profession, and comparative systems. But in the long ago past, I actually, before becoming a law professor, at one point served as justice and social policy advisor to the Premier of Ontario uh, at a time when that Premier was neoconservative and a libertarian bent was actually quite in play in terms of the Canadian system itself. So you may have discerned the accent, eh? In dealing with a lot of these questions about changes to medical care systems and the ethical decisions that were being made in a Canadian system that often wasn't working all that well. And so in that respect, at least, one of the things that I want to make sure that everybody's aware of is that we know that in this room, in addition to all of the backgrounds that you're bringing, there are a variety of political perspectives. Please know that we're approaching this, and I'm approaching the selection of questions, as well as the manner in which they're being posed from a strictly nonpartisan perspective, except where that's identified, and I'll identify that in the question. And so in that respect, at least, I appreciate your understanding in that regard. One of the things that a number of you have asked in terms of, and I'll start TR with you on this, is the political will question. In terms of system reform, you've talked in your book and in your documentary, as well as in your talk tonight, about the fact of needing sort of a certain political will in order to affect systemic change. One of the questions asks about you know, California's previous attempts to try and provide or pass legislation for a single payer insurance model. Another talks about a USA Today and Gallup poll that was reported in the local newspaper, noting that a couple of years after the new health care law was enacted, three quarters of registered voters believe that the law's requirement that every American carry health care insurance is unconstitutional, and the vast majority of voters polled believe that the law has no effect on them. So if your message is hitting you know, the effete population of PBS viewers and NPR listeners and latte sipping professors like me, um, that what can be viewed as a very conservative type of approach is unconstitutional or inefficient. How do you end up getting the dialogue going and the discussion around it being an ethical approach when it's such a politically difficult issue? How do you motivate the population that way to affect change and what have you learned from the way in which it was developed in other countries? Uh, my, my contention has been <coughs> If Americans knew how cruel our system was, they'd fix it. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think Americans understand how bad our healthcare system is, and uh, uh, for the most part, our leaders have uh, tried to fuzz it over. President Bush said countless times, everybody in America get, can get healthcare, you just go to the emergency room. Uh, this is not true, there are a lot of essential kinds of care that you can't get at the emergency room. And every time President Bush said that, the next day the White House press secretary would say, well, he didn't really mean it. He was just kind of generalizing. But he always said it. And Americans like that notion. Yeah, we don't live in a community where some people die because they can't see a doctor. In fact, we all do. Um, so I, I think maybe Americans don't get how bad our system is. and. If we did, we'd fix it. In my book and in our movie, when I went around the world, I went to a couple of countries that in the 1990s um, went from large numbers of people uninsured to universal coverage, just as I'd like to see us do. One was Taiwan. Taiwan was a country of about 33 million, and it's, it's not like the United States. It's, it was. Taiwan is one of these Asian tigers. In 1970, it probably ranked about 60th in the world in per capita income, and by 1995, it ranked 15th in the world. It just got really rich, and they decided we're a rich country. We want to cover everybody like the rich countries do. Um, part of Taiwan's motivation was to beat the mainland to this goal. 
And so they did it. They had a national referendum and did it. But the other country that is very much, I think, like us, although smaller, is Switzerland. Switzerland is an intensely uh, capitalist country, giant insurance companies, giant drug companies, lots of money floating through their political system. And uh, Switzerland, by 1994, had gotten to the point where about 8% of their population couldn't get health insurance. We're at 16.5% now, but in Switzerland, that was a national crisis. And they, too, had a big national effort and changed their law so that the insurance companies have to cover everybody. Everybody's covered. Um, I think the common theme in both of those countries was that a leader came along and said to people, doggone it, we have a moral obligation to get this done. In other words, it was the moral argument that prevailed in both of those countries. And I don't think we've had the leader yet who has made that argument will get Americans to do the right thing. And I've already talked to a lot. I'll just tell you one more thing. When you write a book, you know, you, you, you go out on these TV and radio talk shows to sell your book, and a lot of them are run by very loud conservatives, you know, and uh, they shout at you. And uh, I, there's a guy named Mike Rosen who has a syndicated radio program. I get along quite well with him. He's done most of my books. And I went on Mike Rosen's show to sell my health care book. And, um, the, you know, I walked into the studio and he says, Tom, how you doing? How Peggy and the kids? Hey, congrats on the book. It's doing great. You know, really nice fella. And then the red light goes on, you know. He says, Mr. Reed, you left-wing wingnut. How could you, you know, like that. He got totally into character. And, you know, those people, their listeners all agree with them. And Mike Rosen said to me, he said, here was his argument. He said, yeah, he says, look, 85% of the people in America are satisfied with their health care arrangements. Why should we mess everything up for the 15%? I don't buy this premise, but anyway. Uh, I didn't have a very good answer to that. And maybe 10 minutes later, one of his listeners, you know, a guy who probably agrees with him, calls up and says, hey, Mike, I heard that question. You know, here's the thing. 85% of the people in Montgomery, Alabama could ride in the front of the bus. So why did we mess everything up for the 15%? And, of course, the answer is Americans will do the right thing if a leader takes them there. And I think that's the way we're going to get health care done, is a leader is going to come along to convince us to do what we probably want to do anyway. Another group of questions actually asks certain things along the same theme. In terms of your examination of the models, and one of the fundamental problems, of course, and I know this from the Canadian system and working with the government trying to grapple with it, is who pays mm -hmm. and the costs associated with it. So the yeah. fundamental issue, or one of the fundamental rebuttals to healthcare for all is, well, basically, why should I have to pay for somebody else? And what did you find? So the question's coming in, what do you find from each of the three models that you identified, the first three at least, uh, implemented by those countries in terms of addressing the costs? And then a related question that's come in is, what kind of impact does the present system in the United States with financial interests from big pharma, from insurance companies, from medical care providers, and others who are profit-driven end up meaning for that kind of fundamental change. So addressing the costs in the other systems and what it means in terms of the impact here. Yes, I get this question a lot. Here, here's what I get quite often. Yeah, well, those European countries, they can afford to cover everybody because they don't have any military. We're defending them. Now, that's not a logical statement because they spend less. Can I say this again? They spend half as much on health care as we do. If you cover everybody and do it in an organized way like they do, they spend less. So in terms of the money, look, every country is worried about the cost of health care. Health care is expensive and going through the roof in every country. Nobody's got that part figured out. But um, they all spend less than we do per capita and as a share of GDP. In fact, a very common, when, when complaints are raised about healthcare systems in other countries, and there always are, no, you know, everybody always has a problem with the healthcare system, it, it's common anyway. The, a, a fairly standard answer from the people in power is, oh God, you wanna be like the United States? <laughs> and nobody does, so that's always kind of the, the, the winning political argument. Uh, so they're all worried about costs, but their costs are lower 
than ours and all those other countries. So I don't see that as an issue. The question, why should I have to pay for my neighbor? I, I didn't hear that much in the other countries. Did I hear that? I did. There, there was a, when I was in Britain, there was a columnist in Britain who said uh, he had gone to the pub and there was a big fat guy sitting at the bar with his pint of bitter and his bowl of chips and his french fries. Big fat guy. And this columnist says in the column that he went over to this guy in the pub and said, hey mate, I'm gonna have to pay for your heart attack. You know, because it's the National Health Service and everybody pays through taxes for the, and then, and then thousands of letters poured into this guy. Yeah, well you live in a society, you live in a community that takes care of people. Would you rather go to the US where they don't? You know, kind of thing. <laughs> so I didn't see, I very rarely saw I don't feel a responsibility to help my neighbors who happen to be sick. I think the more common attitude was, hey, if I'm young and healthy, I'm lucky. I'm not gonna begrudge somebody who doesn't have those virtues. I'm gonna try to help them out. That was more the attitude. Um, and because it's cheaper than what we're spending, you know, why not go with that system? A couple of questions have come in in terms of the impact in different systems of one of the features of the American system that doesn't necessarily translate, which is tortism, mm -hmm. the tort reform. And so the questioners are inviting you to discuss how medical malpractice is dealt with, what yeah. sorts of restrictions on damages, yeah. attorneys, fees, and others in each of the other healthcare systems that you examined, and how they end up controlling tort costs in those systems and whether or not you think that would translate to a workable solution here. Yeah. Uh, look, every country has to deal with the problem of patients who are injured in a hospital or a doctor's office. It happens everywhere. Um, nobody has chosen to do this through the tort system except the United States. Uh, it's just not a good way to do it. It's incredibly inefficient. Large amounts of the money never get to the patient who's injured. Um, and the disciplinary uh, goal of disciplining the doctor who might have acted uh, badly doesn't, all, doesn't work because most of those suits fail. So the tort system, no other country has decided to use the tort system to deal with this need. There are various ways to do it. Um, in Britain, there's a board that has set the standard for every kind of medical procedure and if something went wrong in your operation or you came away sick and you can prove that the doctor didn't follow the established procedure, well then you win some, you can win some damages. Uh, but most doctors do follow the procedure, so it's very rare for anybody to win that kind of case. In Germany, they have an interesting procedure. In Germany, a specialist in your field from another part of the country comes into your office, your doctor's office for a week and goes through the files. And there, are, if somebody writes in a letter complaining, he sees that letter and, and the visiting specialist studies the case and decides whether to discipline. The uh, tort law system is just a really inefficient and unfair way to solve, to deal with this <laughs> common problem. It's lay juries deciding very technical medical questions, et cetera. But, but, I don't think it adds a lot to our cost. I, I think it adds a lot to doctors' angst. Um, it's not a good way to deal with the problem. But most of the studies show it adds one or one and a half, two percent to the cost. And as a matter of fact, we have really good kind of laboratory experimentation on this. I don't know about California, but I think there are 11 states that have passed quite strict limits on malpractice judgments. Has California done that? Yeah. Um, uh, Texas has the strictest malpractice limits in the country. Rick Perry ran for president on the basis of that law. And guess what, since Texas passed that law in 2004, its costs have gone up higher than the national average. In other words, if money's being saved, the doctors and insurance companies aren't passing it on to patients. And the number of tests has not gone down in Texas either. And the great doctor at Harvard, Atul Gawande, went to Texas and said to doctors, hey, you guys, you're not gonna be sued anymore. You can't lose a malpractice case anymore. Why are you doing all these tests? And the docs, well, I learned it in medical school. Or I'm a good doctor, I wanna know all I can about my patients. So I think the argument 
that the tort system drives a lot of unnecessary testing is probably not accurate either because the docs do them whether they're going to be sued or not. But overall, it's, it's a rotten way to deal with a common problem and no other country has done it that way. Another few questions coming in in terms of the Affordable Health Care Act, and I'll, this will be the last one for the TR for a little bit, unless there are a few coming in. It's a good way to transition. The Affordable Health Care Act requires everybody to buy insurance states to set up exchanges offering health care plans. In your view, Tom, if, if this is implemented, does it make the mosaic of models better in getting closer to something covering everybody, or does it actually make things worse? Um, <coughs> it's 50-50. Uh, it, it, it covers more people uh, in, in, by its terms. It's supposed to provide coverage to 32 million Americans who are not, who don't have insurance today. I'm not sure that, that it, it will do that well, but um, that would be a good thing. Nobody, you can't argue against expanding coverage to people who don't have insurance today. Um, and the exchanges could work. The exchanges could be a form of competition in health insurance uh, that would maybe keep prices down. I think that system could work too. The flaw with Obamacare, well the fundamental flaw is it doesn't get to the goal that I have just set forth. It does not cover everybody. According to the White House, if it works perfectly, we'll still have 23 million Americans uninsured in 2016 when it's taken full effect. In other words, they never set out. President Obama ran on a promise of universal coverage, but then he compromised that away. So to me, it's a, it's a, a flawed bill. Um, You've heard the term budget busting health care plan. Uh, uh, on its own terms, it's not a budget buster because it predicts costs of $940 billion over 10 years. And guess what? It's got $940 billion of new taxes. And they're pretty smart taxes. They're, the taxes are levied on insurance companies, drug companies, hospital companies. The companies that are going to win big from this bill are going to pay for it. The flaw with that is, the $940 billion is a lie. It's going to actually cost a heck of a lot more than the price tag. Um, it's not a government takeover of medicine. Don't believe that. If it takes full effect, the vast majority of Americans under 65, more than 80%, will still have private insurance and private doctors. So it's not a government takeover of medicine. But So it does a lot of good stuff. It outlaws some of the crueler practices of the insurance industry. Uh, but it does not get us to universal coverage, and therefore, eh, it doesn't pass my test. Question for Professor Jacobs. Your article makes the point, in the Sacramento Bee, makes the point that Congress cannot use the commerce power to support an action that's simply for safety or health. Does that mean that our Constitution could not or cannot support action based on the purely ethical basis that uh, T.R. Reid is actually urging? Um, well, certainly that wouldn't, it, it, you couldn't have a law that was only for the purpose of doing something ethical. Congress would have to point to a power that it has in the Constitution to be able to do it, and it could also be ethical. And that's what a lot of our laws are, right? Um, that is, well, I don't know. I mean, a number of different types of laws that regulate different types of things. For example, a number of the criminal laws um, that uh, you know, Congress passes criminal laws and then the U.S. Attorney's Office or the Justice Department enforce them. Um, obviously, those that are enforcing ethics don't commit mail fraud, but the reason that Congress is allowed to pass that law is because in the statute, it says you have to use the mail, which is a instrumentality that crosses state lines. So Congress couldn't pass a law that says no murder because Congress thinks and is representing the people to say murder is a bad thing. Now that doesn't mean murder can't be prohibited, but states are the ones who can prohibit murder on purely ethical grounds. Another couple of questions for you, Professor Jacobs, with respect to the minimum coverage provisions. Pointing to prior decisions, which are referenced here. One, there's a case cited during the health care debate in which Congress in the late 1700s or early 1800s, so dealing with the framers, required the owners of merchant sailing vessels to carry insurance. Um, 
in terms of today's debate and the constitutional challenge, in terms of the intent of the framers type of argument, wouldn't that be fairly compelling? Gosh, um, I mean, I don't know exactly about the merchant sailors. I know that the argument, uh, people all have been often talking about, um, well, you have to pay for a driver's license in order to drive. Now, again, the states do that, not Congress. Um, but the merchant vessel, I think the difference would be that you're choosing to have a merchant vessel and to operate it in a commercial sort of way, and so then you can be required to do something. The argument that people make against the uh, minimum coverage provision is that you're not doing anything commercial when Congress forces you, by just saying you're gonna have to pay a penalty, but forces you to um, purchase insurance. And so that would be the difference. Tiara, back to you. In terms of a couple of questions about the way in which other systems work and how they might be implemented here, in terms of the description of what you've provided uh, for these other systems in other countries, are there restrictions on people providing uh, or, or purchasing additional medical services outside the system? So not in your you know, number four example in terms of the, yeah, the actual yeah. out-of-pocket type of model, but incentives or restrictions. Like I know, for example, from the Canadian system, mm -hmm. um, the, the federal government actually denies yeah. funding to the provinces in circumstances where they allow for either doctors to extra bill or people to pay for or purchase private, private health care services. There is a default uh, that actually serves as a private health care system, which is go across the border. Yeah. So if you're in Toronto, you go to Buffalo. Yeah. If you're in Vancouver, you go to Seattle you want that, you can go purchase it, but it has to be outside the system. In terms of other systems that you've studied, yeah. are there either provisions permitting it or restricting it, and what do you think about it? Uh, Canada and Sweden, both quite egalitarian societies, have both said you get the health care that's in the system and you can't get health care outside of the system because they don't want doctors practicing outside of the system. They're afraid of what would happen and what does happen in some countries is doctors set up these boutique <coughs> practices. They only see rich people and other people in that community to take care. But those are the only two that have restricted your right to buy health care outside of the system. In all the other countries, if you have the money, you can go buy health care. You've heard of these famous Harley Street doctors in Britain. They're private. They're not part of the National Health Service. And you can go down there and pay them, pay the bill, and they'll do anything. Uh, my personal feeling is uh, rich people are going to get good health care uh, and they're not our problem. So if Canadians want to go to the Mayo Clinic and pay out of pocket, fine. I don't think we should try to stop that. Uh, the real concern is everybody else. Let's provide health care for everybody else. Um, and most countries have decided they just can't prevent rich people from buying care elsewhere. Uh, Germany's done an interesting thing. Germany has this system where, as I said, there's one set of forms, one set of rules. They have a lot of different insurance companies, but they're all the same. They all act the same and follow the same rules and pay the same fee to the doctor. Um, but if you want, uh, if, if your income last year put you in the top 10% of all Germans in terms of income, you're allowed not to buy that insurance and just deal privately with the doctor. Um, and the Germans kind of defend this because they think it's a safety valve that relieves pressure on, on doctors and hospitals. Uh, as a matter of fact, it hasn't worked because only a tiny number of Germans have ever taken advantage of this, this freedom. And the reason is once you leave the system, you can't get back in. So if your income happens to drop the next year and you can't afford it anymore, and Germans are pretty risk averse kind of people, so they don't take this bet. One of the things that hasn't been discussed tonight comes up in the next question that, that was posed that I think is an interesting uh, dilemma for all systems and particularly right now. What about the ways in which the systems that you've studied deal with preventive medicine? So investing up front to make sure that people don't get sick rather than dealing with the dilemma of the expense when they do. What did you see in the systems that you studied that actually focused better resources or focused in a better and different way on preventative uh, steps being taken in terms of healthcare implementation? And what might you learn from that? Yeah, I, I spent a lot of time on this in my book because um, 
here's the deal. Look, if you or your child happens to be sick, then a good doctor in a good hospital, that's a matter of life and death. But for overall population health, good doctors and good hospitals are a relatively small part of achieving overall population health. What we would call public health, preventive medicine, those measures do a much better job of keeping whole populations healthy. And I argue in my book that if everybody is in the system, as they are in the other countries, then the system has an economic incentive to spend the money on preventive care. Preventive health care is really good. It fights disease, it extends lives, it eliminates visits to the hospital, uh, but it's expensive. And the problem with it is quite often you're not gonna get a return on that expenditure for decades. Let's say we spend money now to keep some 18 year old from smoking. It would have been 40 years before she got lung cancer and we had to treat her. Are you with me on this? So there's this, and, and in America, the average person stays with the private insurance company 4.8 years and then you get a new job or your spouse gets a new job or something. So the insurance system really doesn't have any interest in keeping you healthy. Why would they spend money on that? By the time you get sick, you're the next guy's problem. Or in the case of these latent uh, chronic diseases of aging, you're Medicare's problem. Whereas if everybody's in cradle to grave, that system really has an interest in keeping you healthy. And I argue in my book, and you know, Paul, I think this must be right because this is the definitive text on the subject. Uh, that the world champion at preventive health is Great Britain. I just think they did a fab, do a fabulous job. I don't know, maybe somebody here has lived in Britain and saw what I saw. You walk down the street in Britain and there's a big billboard. Do your feet hurt? Call this 800 number. We'll send a podiatrist to your house for free. Well, of course it's free because it's all free. This makes a lot of sense. To pay for that $130 house call that doctor might spot something that could have led to a $30,000 amputation two or three years down the road. Are you with me on this? Uh, um, there's just a lot of stuff going on in Britain where they really work. There are posters everywhere. Is mom coughing a lot? Call this 800 number, we'll send a nurse free. It's all free, of course. Um, and I, when I was there, I got to know Tony Blair and Gordon Brown's health minister who was Scott named John Reed, a really good guy. And I was traveling around with him when I was working on this book. And I said to him, hey, I, I just want to say thank you because you know, my family lived in Britain and uh, I just feel your health ministry really worked hard to keep me and my family healthy. And uh, you know, politicians don't like it when a reporter thanks them. I think they <laughs> did a blunder there. He said, thank me, thank me, why would you thank me, he said. And, uh, and, and, and I said, well, you know, your, your, your ministry is full of people, smart people working hard to keep my kids healthy. Thank you. He said, oh, you needn't thank me. You needn't thank me. He said, isn't it obvious why I do that? Isn't it obvious? Well, no, tell me why. And here's what he said. He said, you know, I run the National Health Service. Everybody in Britain is in it. From the minute the line turns blue on your mother's pregnancy test until the minute you flatline in my hospital 90 years later, you're my patient. Of course I want to keep you healthy. You see what I'm getting at? To me, there's an incentive there for preventive medicine. And the other countries do better at it because they have an economic incentive that our system kind of undermines. One of the other difficult areas that comes up in the next question that hasn't been addressed to this point is the dealing, uh, the way in which the healthcare paradigm in each of these different systems deals with mental illness and addiction issues. And the concern that's been raised about the way in which the current system either addresses or fails to address that here, and the notion at least that mental illness and addiction is often still treated as a moral failing rather than something physical oh, right. yeah. And so the questioner invites your kind of comment both in terms of what you saw in terms of the treatment of addiction and mental health issues elsewhere and what challenges you think that poses, if any in particular, for reforming the American system. Well, on paper at least, all the uh, other rich countries uh, treat mental illness, behavioral health, just like physical health. That is, it's an issue. Our healthcare system has to deal with it. Insurance companies are not allowed to limit reimbursement for this kind of care. Um, on paper at least, they treat it just like everybody else. But as a matter of fact, many countries 
are way understaffed in terms of psychologists, psychiatrists, and other behavioral health technicians. There just aren't enough people, so you wait a long time. Certainly that's true in Canada. Um, it's true in a lot of countries. Um, why is this? People going to medical school don't want to do that kind of work? I don't know why it would be. So in theory, they think behavioral health problems are just the same as physical health and they don't discriminate, but in practice, it's harder to get treatment. Question for Leslie. What constitutional foundations safeguard direct patient care relationships and where does the issue of the power of the individual to decide their own health care decisions weigh into the current constitutional challenge, if at all? Um, hmm. I'm not sure I understand the first part, but as to the second part, um, trying to find a uh, right of an individual to make their own health care decisions um, it really doesn't weigh at all into the current challenges. The current challenges have to do with the power of Congress, um, and it's a state versus Congress sort of thing. Um, as far as um, an individual right to make health care decisions, um, there is one to a limited extent um, in the 14th Amendment, um, but it's a very limited right. Uh, has been interpreted essentially to say that people can um, avoid having things put into them. The next question comes with one of these not entirely shameless um, PS notes. I've bought at least 20 of your books and given it to friends on both sides of the aisle. Thank you very much. <laughs> so of course that pops right up to the top of my Discerning list. Discerning reader, thank you. Um, given that the health, and I think this is actually a good way to sort of circle back on a broad sense, given your perspective that the health care mandate is flawed or incomplete or doesn't accomplish it, is it a basis at least from which to continue further reform? Are we better off with what we've got as a step ahead or should we start again? Yeah, what a good question. Um, if it were a start, then I'd say yeah, that's fine because it's definitely better than what we've got. It gets 32 million more people covered, as I said, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the problem is I don't think the Democrats see it as a first step. They see it as a last step. They never want to go back to health care. They feel burned by it. So um, I, this is one of the reasons I'm frustrated. If somebody said, hey, last year we got 32 million more, now let's get to those last 23 million, uh, then I'd feel, yes, it's, it's a progressive step. But they, they don't feel that way. Everybody, this is done. We're done with health care for a while. So um, I feel we've got to start over. We have to have somebody who's not tied to the Affordable Care Act who says that bill didn't go far enough or that bill wasn't the right direction, so let's start over and find a way to cover everybody. Uh, let me ask you this. If, if the Supreme Court says Congress can't force people to buy private insurance, can Congress force people to buy Medicare? What con that's actually a very interesting question. Uh, because, yeah, I mean, Medicare is constitutional, and the reason is because it's the tax and spend power, right? Because what Congress does there is it takes it over as a federal program, and it taxes all of us, and then we all pay. And so that would be a fine way to accomplish this objective, too. That is, Congress could have chosen to have universal health care and tax everyone and then pay for a federal program or pay for private however they wanted to do it. Um, but they didn't. Instead, they did it this different way, which raises the um, constitutional question. Yeah, so, uh, so this is my thought. Maybe the, the opponents of the bill have shot themselves in the foot. If they win in the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court says you can't make anybody buy private insurance, we're still going to have 50 million people uninsured. We're still going to have uh, health care costs going up at double the rate of inflation. We're still going to need a fix, and the only constitutional fix left would be to say, okay, everybody's on Medicare or everybody's in a public program, and does that achieve the Republicans' goal? I, I, I'd say no. <laughs> the last two questions, or one for each of you, actually fall into what I'll call the prognostication and crystal ball category. So, <laughs> Leslie, to you first. <laughs> what do you think's going to happen? <laughs> to call. Um, I mean, I, 
as I said in my article, I, I, I really don't see the five votes to strike down the health care law. I could be wrong, but I, I just don't see it. Um, and so I do think there's a possibility um, that there are five votes to flat out uphold it. Um, I also think that the tax route provides an out. Um, and so I would predict they would go either one of those ways. Who are the four votes? So, oh, oh, you know, I, um, are you asking? Oh, I guess I should, that's the one thing I actually didn't talk about is the split in the court at this point in time. I'm sorry, I should, that would have been a good fundamental thing. Um, and quite frankly, when I was gonna do a PowerPoint, I had a picture and I was gonna take you through yeah, it. Yeah. And then I didn't do the PowerPoint, yeah. so I didn't talk to you about it. Um, but yes, um, the, the court at this point uh, in time has um, four justices, well, five, four and a half, who are considered, uh, <laughs> on the conservative side of things, that's um, Justice uh, Roberts, Justice Alito, Justice Scalia, and Justice Thomas. And then um, the four who are on the more liberal side of things, which are Justice Breyer, Justice Sotomayor, Justice Kagan, and um, who am I forgetting? Ginsburg. Ginsburg, yeah. Justice Ginsburg. Okay, and then <laughs> Justice Kennedy being supposedly in the middle, but really more often, um, twice as much last year when there were five, four decisions, voting with the conservatives um, when it was a close call. So when we're talking about this, I'm sorry, but it really is um, hinged to these positions. And so when I talk about five justices, I am thinking about those blocks. Um, and you know, as far as upholding the law, we'd be looking have a, a break off from the conservative block. People look at Justice Kennedy. Um, we were talking beforehand, mm -hmm. I don't know, just Alito, maybe? I mean, who knows? Um, and uh, I don't see any of the four uh, liberal justices uh, voting to, to strike it down. I, I just, I find that incredible. NTR, the last word to you in terms of prognostications. So apart from the constitutional challenge, what do you think the way forward is for the public debate and the dialogue about healthcare decisions? And back to your point and your theme for tonight, how much will the ethical and moral dimension factor into that dialogue and debate? I believe the <coughs> ethical argument is a winning argument in, in American history and in, in, in this issue. Uh, and therefore, I had actually been hoping for a while that the Supreme Court would throw out the individual mandate. Uh, without the individual mandate, a heck of a lot of that bill would collapse. There's some things that would survive, but a lot of the Affordable Care Act would collapse. And my thesis was, okay, that'll liberate the Democrats. They don't have to defend this act anymore, and they can go back and run on universal coverage, which they won on in 2008. It's a little pie in the sky, and I did suggest this at a meeting in Washington, and they basically said, go home to Colorado, you don't know what you're talking about, they didn't hear. But I now feel the Supreme Court is gonna uphold the individual mandate, <clears throat> and the reason I feel that is I read this decision by, is it Lawrence Silverman, is that his name? Yes. Yeah. Justice, uh, Judge Silverman is on the DC, on the US Court of Appeals in DC, he's a very, very highly respected uh, conservative, I think he was Scalia's teacher, and uh, he wrote an opinion upholding the bill, and it, it's just, it's absolutely convincing to me. It was very well done. He relied a lot on the Scalia case um, to do it. And therefore, I think if some conservative is really on the fence and not inclined to make a political choice, but a legal choice, might well be swayed by this, this uh, preeminent conservative's opinion that the, Supreme, the Congress can provide people, require people to buy, pro, buy health insurance because we have a huge national issue and the Constitution is not a straitjacket that prevents us from acting on big national problems. That was his argument. And to me, that's a prevailing, uh, interesting, ar good argument. So I think the Supreme Court will uphold the mandate. And um, I don't think that will stop the Republican candidate from complaining about Obamacare. I don't think that will silence that, but I think for a lot of Americans, as the Supreme Court says, yeah, this is okay, they'll accept it and say, okay, let's, let's go to the exchange and figure out how to make this bill work. Thank you all very much for a really 
terrific range of questions that have prompted, I think, some dialogue and debate that's both necessary, constructive, and can hopefully animate things on the way forward. Thank you all very much indeed for coming this evening. Please join me in thanking both Professor Jacobs and Mr.